back in Kubinka, this time in front of the IS-4. Development of IS-4 started in November 1943, although production didn't start until 1946, it missed the war. The idea was to try to take into account any defects or improvements from the IS-2, incorporate any captured enemy technology. As a result, you're going to see a couple of things that do link to the IS-2, but you're also going to find some completely novel features that don't exist in any other Soviet vehicles of the era. We're going to do this in the typical fashion, exterior first, have a look at the suspension, go around up to the engine deck, move forward onto the turret and then inside, and uh, we should get a pretty good overview of the vehicle that way. One of the first differences you're going to notice with IS-2 is the front slope. So IS-2 had a sort of a stepped front slope with an almost vertical driver's uh, port. This was deemed something of a weak point. Part of the design parameters for uh, IS-4 was it was supposed to withstand the 8.8 L71 German cannon. So what they did was uh, made a single glasses, they added additional armor protection to the driver, and that was deemed sufficient. Uh, other features on the front slope, nothing too unusual. You have your standard service drive and horn. The two little plates in between the tow hooks, those are, I'm told, for service markings. Every time the tank went, went in for modification or service, they would engrave the update onto that. And uh, the only last thing to note is that the fenders are spring-loaded and you can lift them up and they will actually hold in position, which seems to be a bit of a, an excess to me, but what the hey. All right, so the fender, Soviet over-engineering at its finest. You undo a latch here and simply they get locked into position. Now, why exactly they felt the need to put this particular creature comfort on the tank, I'm not entirely sure. I have to say, if I was going to put life improvements, spring-loaded fenders would probably not be number one on my list of priorities. No particular surprises when you get to the running gear. You basically take an IS-2, you add an extra set of road wheels. So we now have seven pair per side. Torsion bar again, uh, point to interneute. The bump stops do exist, similar to other torsion bar vehicles. However, unlike, let's say, an American vehicle, there are no shock absorbers or friction snubbers or anything like that to stop the rocking effect of the torsion bar. They simply rely on mass. The wheels themselves, you'll see they have cast serial numbers, so you know who made them. Uh, lubrication, they've actually pulled off a bolt on this one. That's how you add your oil, put the bolt back in, and away you go. Track tension, similar again to the other ISs. There's a locking plate, you kick the locking plate out of the way, you then get your big wrench and crank the, uh, the screw forwards or backwards to extend the idler wheel forwards and backwards. Track, the same as uh, pretty much anything else in the IS series. The only difference here is that we now have a center guide on every individual track link instead of the more typical alternating version. Single pin kept in place by a clip and a couple of washers. The last thing to point out is that the side skirts are a mid-life modification they were added in the 50s. And unlike, say, the IS-3, the side hull doesn't angle out to the side. It's a simple uh, angular step. There is absolutely nothing of interest on this side of the tank whatsoever because it had to leave room for the unditching log which would be mounted here. Moving to the rear of the tank, things get a little bit more interesting again. Each fender could hold two cylindrical 90 litre fuel tanks side by side. These again are not attached to the fuel system, they are simply to be siphoned or pumped into the internal fuel tanks. To the rear center are the mounting points for the MDH smoke generators. Uh, MDH, I'm told, stands for Small Naval Generator. Simple enough. Uh, they are equipped with a quick detach for the driver. He can just pull a lever and the things will fall off if for some reason he needs to. To the front of that is the large access port uh, for the transmission housing. Uh, looks like to open it up you have to do a lot of unbolting of bolts and then you, it's, it's a big piece of metal so it looks like you need two or three lads just to lift it up. Seems very inconvenient to me, I wouldn't want to be doing it routinely. The gun travel lock of course for holding the gun you spin the turret to the rear if you're undertaking maybe rail heading. Uh, spinning to the rear has two functions. Firstly it reduces the overhang so the amount of length of tank is reduced and secondly it's a good crutch it stops uh, any excess of uh, uh, load on the elevation mechanism uh, due to bumps or whatever because it's just simply locked in place. As you move to the rear we have the convoy light, marker light 
and uh, not much else. As we come along the left-hand side of the tank, we now have room for two stowage boxes, no log. Exhaust, one on each side of course, you may have noticed as we went around the far side. And then we move up until the turret. Uh, turret has mounting points for uh, gun maintenance equipment, lots and lots of handles for the tank riders. The tank riders were the infantry that would ride on the tank, and then uh, when they got into combat, they'd bail off the side and go on foot. We suspect this is the intercom system for the infantry commander to speak with the tank crew as the tank crew likely would have been buttoned up. Which does beg the question, if it's dangerous enough for the tank crew to be buttoned up, why in God's name would he be riding on the outside of the tank? However, I don't get paid to make those decisions. Next stop, engine deck. As you get up on the engine deck, the obvious thing you're going to see here are the circular radiator fans, shamelessly stolen from the Germans. Uh, outside of that, not too much. There is the central port here for the cooling. There are two fuel tanks. The left fuel tank is 295 liters. The right fuel tank is 115, giving you a grand total of 410, which will get you about 170 kilometers. If you traverse the turret to one side, there is an access port for the engine itself. You can lift it up, it hinges sideways, and you can see the top of the V12. Moving forward, casting mark on the turret. And uh, again, a loader's 12.7mm uh, Dushka, uh, which goes to quite a significant angle of elevation. Very easily. Blade sight, optical sight. I'm told 60 rounds in the magazine. 